Fuller. Uh, dear God, we just thank you for this uh, opportunity for us men to come together. Uh, you have blessed this group for more than 30 years, God, and, um, and kept us together. Uh, the pandemic has certainly given us our own set of challenges, and you, I pray God, will give us the wisdom and the direction for continuing this to go and how we can use social media and other things to keep this fellowship connected. God, we say a special prayer for John at the loss of his wife, Sherry. I just can't imagine what it's going through right now. And God, we're very pleased that he's with us uh, today. And uh, let us all uh, have a warm ha uh, hand on his heart. Um, and God, Big D brought up some very important points, as did Harry, uh, about uh, the double standards now and, and the contradictions out there and uh, what's going on in our society, specifically as it relates to not only the uh, uh, COVID, but also uh, relate uh, the uh, uh, our Black Lives Matters and just how we treat other individuals. And God, just bless those people at hospice. Um, this is a very difficult time that they're having to deal with, and and that they be very sensitive and. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult. It's a different time for them and that they continue to be love and kind. And God, we do that too for the families who are losing loved ones and how they having difficulty bringing closure to those with the fact that we can't even have a, a what we've come to know as a traditional funeral services. So God, we just lift you up into our hearts and we're thankful that we are part of you and that you will look after each and every one of us. I'm in. All right, Jack Fuller, please step up, bring us up to speed on what's going on with you and your life, and then uh, what great words of wisdom you have for us today. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, listen, I appreciate all of your prayers that uh, have been offered up for me. Uh, I'm out of the danger zone that uh, was at one time there with the uh, cancer getting into the liver, which is normal now. Thank goodness. And uh, this next week on Friday, I have next CT scan, which uh, is targeting the uh, tumor down on my left uh, hip groin area, which will guide them as far as the future, whether to uh, continue on with the chemo or whether to go with a uh, clinical trial, which is two chemo um, pills per day. And it's been very successful in rats. So I just, uh, Pray I don't start uh, growing a tail uh, <laughs> if that's the new trial. <laughs> so anyway, I appreciate your prayers and it's going well. But uh, today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, one of the Old Testament stories, and that is Nehemiah, that I think is really very, very appropriate in what we're all going through today as far as the quarantine situation and the... Uh, <clears throat> the COVID, you know, it's kind of like a dark cloud hanging over our heads. And, uh, you know, I've noticed even within the last two weeks, just an added frustration with people, including myself, uh, with this COVID and, you know, just being quarantined in our house for the most part. But the story of Nehemiah, it gives us a, an example of courage in the Bible there was a tremendous dark cloud hanging over Nehemiah's head also. And to give you the background, the people of Jerusalem, where Nehemiah once lived, they were captured and taken to Babylon, whereas the weak people were left behind in Jerusalem. Nehemiah had relocated to Susa, and he was the cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah tested all the king's food and drink, for poison, and uh, he was considered the cupbearer in that respect. So he was, in a sense, quarantined similar to what we are now. Uh, they wanted to protect his health so that he could test the food as well as the drink of the king to make sure there was no poison in there. So it was a very dangerous job, but one that got him very much favor with the king. And it was a very stable job, 
you know, as long as there wasn't poison <laughs> in his food or in the drink of the king, at which point his life would be very short lived. So there were some positives. <clears throat> one of which was that he got very close to the king. And there are some positives associated with this COVID also from our standpoints. So I wanna open up the floor just for a few minutes to ask what are the positives that we can see that have happened from this COVID situation? I'm gonna go get a drink of water. My voice is kind of bad from the uh, chemo here and I'll be right back. Go ahead and discuss any positives you see of the COVID at this stage. Positive for me, I'll go first, because when he said two weeks, I, I sprung up and sat higher in my chair. Um, for two weeks, it's just been pure hell, but yet here's the positive. It's taught me to seek the positive in Christ so that I can make it through the hell that I think I'm going through. Um, I just, I, I came up with that right now. Thank you, Lord. But it's just a lot of opportunities to learn the people I live with and them to learn me. We're so close and we're so tied up with each other. We, like a couple people have mentioned, have decided until it's safe fur, safer, <laughs> we will just stay at home and, and go to the grocery store, go get gas only. And it's just the way it is, but it, it causes it causes being on top of each other in four walls for 12 hours, 14 hours a day that we really never were experienced before. So the positive for me is just, I get an opportunity to draw closer to him and then learn my family and really talk instead of yelling, which has been for a couple of the two weeks, but yet coming to, together and say, I'm, I'm sorry for this, I didn't know that, you do that. I didn't even think you did that. And I've been with you for 11, 18 years, if that makes sense. Church was always going to um, have developed capability to stream our worship services and Sunday schools and Bible studies and whatnot. And uh, we always, it was always something we're going to do next year. And this just speeds <clears throat> the process and we've we're bringing in, we have more people watching now than what we had sitting in the pews before, and it's really been a blessing. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, one of the other stories that's really appropriate here is the story of Elijah. Elijah was in a cave hiding from Jezebel, who was the wicked wife of King Ahab. She was trying to kill him. Well, God met him in the cave and whispered to him, He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? God gave him specific directions what to accomplish. And this is an ideal time for us while we are not busy, but rather have a quiet COVID cave that we can take time to hear God's quiet, still small voice as to how he wants us to proceed now or later in life. This is an ideal time to get close to God with Bible study, prayer, and listening to God's guidance. Well, in Susa, Nehemiah received a report that the wall and gates around the city of Jerusalem had been knocked down and that their enemies were stealing their goods and attacking their men and women. This greatly saddened him and God directed him to help them. Can you imagine your neighborhood with no security and open to enemies for constant plunder of your house, beating you up, beating your wife up. And this is what he was thinking about. So three things Nehemiah did before approaching the king for help. First of all, he mourned, he even wept, similar to the grieving that we're experiencing through the confinement through the deaths that have been resulting from COVID and through the fear that the media is really sowing into each one of our lives. Second thing he did was he fasted. He did one meal a day or else a full fast for multiple days with water only. Fasting makes our prayers more effective. 
The third thing he did is he prayed before God of heaven. And, you know, from our standpoint, this is our strategy for COVID, is prayer. Nehemiah's prayer to God in the NIV is a very appropriate prayer for us today as we're talking about the COVID. If you look at, uh, I'm in the NIV, if you look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, you can see the prayer that he prayed. And I'm going to read this prayer now because it's very appropriate to a prayer for COVID also. I'm going to change a few things around to be able to make it similar to what we could pray for the COVID. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> says, he starts off with adoration of God. He says, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So this is the adoration of God. It says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you this day and night for your servants and the people of he said, Israel, I'm saying United States. I confess the sins that we Americans, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. So this is the part of it that is the confession part of this prayer, where we're confessing the sins of our country, and our own personal sins. Next, he says, remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses. This is the next key here. It says, remember. Lord, remember that there are people who are just really devoted to you in this country and around the world. And if you, and he said, if you are unfaithful, God said, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if, you, even if your exiled people are at a furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen in this dwelling for my name. And then to this, I would add, Lord, it seems like your people are scattered, even though we might be in the same city it seems like we're scattered because we're having to do Zooms, because we're not able to meet together, because of this COVID has put fear in all of our, our minds as far as that we might catch it. <clears throat> Next, it says, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and by your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. And again, we are humbling ourselves and calling us, Lord, your servants. Give your servant success today by granting him your favor in the presence of this enemy that we call COVID. So this is how Nehemiah prayed before he was going to the king to ask him, for his favor and his release. You gotta ask yourself, why would he risk leaving his job to help rebuild the wall? God asks us to take risks sometimes to accomplish his will. I know with my wife, before we left for Africa the first time, she said she felt like a flower in a pot, a flower that had outgrown the pot and whose Roots were not able to expand anymore. And after we decided to go to Africa, it was like it broke the pot and like the roots were then able to expand into what God wanted us to do. Nehemiah approached the king with a saddened face, remembering all the suffering of his people. This was an infraction that was punishable by death in the kingdom. And while praying to God, and I repeat, while praying to God, and I repeat again, while praying to God, 
he requested three things. So he was praying to God while he was requesting these things from the king. Number one, he requested time off from his cup-bearing duties. Now, this was not an easy, as <laughs> you can imagine, this was not an easy type of job to fill. Very, very high risk. And it was very unlikely that the king was going to enable him to go and to join his friends and his relatives at Jerusalem. But he prayed this while he was asking for time off from his cupbearing duties. Secondly, he asked for a rite of passage letter for the governor of the trans-Euphrates. Thirdly, he asked for a letter to Asaph, who was the keeper of the royal park, to acquire timber to rebuild the gates and the wall. As if this wasn't dangerous enough, he had to travel three days through enemy territory to get to Jerusalem. This was very high risk. Nehemiah said, and because God's hand was upon me, the king granted my request. And that's what our prayer is today. Lord, make your favor upon this nation. Make you this favor upon this world to keep us from this COVID. I want to ask, how does this quote from Nehemiah regarding God's favor apply to us in following God's direction in today's world? Or does it? How does it follow us or apply to us regarding God's favor when we are following God's will? And does God's favor exempt us from the problems associated in following his guidance. Anybody have any thoughts on those two things? Right away, I, I think of the blessing, the song that's kind of circulating on Joy FM, Spirit FM, in our church by Carrie Job and her husband, Cody Carnes, and it's just basically Deuteronomy, no, sorry, the blessing from Moses, Numbers 6, 24 to 26, and it's basically just may his favor shine, up, shine upon us. I mean, just back then, now, and for generations to come. So yes, Jack, I'm, I'm all over the fact that I, my spirit was leaping when you were saying that and how he's led you there because yeah, it does not, so to answer the second question, it does not eliminate us from struggle, strife, challenges, hardships, death, sorrow, but at least we have something to stand on. I love while he was praying, we, we get to understand that as long as we stay in the blessing in the favor of God and keep his face, which is us in his presence upon us, it may be hard, but we'll be able to at least see. A message I was listening to was able to say about the light of God. So when you're in the valley, Psalms 23, and you can look up and go, but on the mountain, I can at least see the light. And if I can see the light, hope can be restored. So yeah, I, I think that that's a very good way to tell us all that God is still with us as long as we keep him <laughs> in front of us and remind ourselves constantly through the struggle. Amen. I heard a pastor on TV uh, last weekend. He said, when God gives you a dream, Satan will come in with a nightmare. And many times <laughs> we see Satan, the last thing he wants is for us to be able to follow God's dream for us or God's direction for us. What's well, the same thing here? Satan tried to derail Nehemiah and discourage his efforts three different times. So the first attempt was their enemies made fun of them for trying to rebuild the huge walls that they had torn down and you could actually step over the walls at that stage and the gates. They said it would take a year to rebuild them. And in the meantime, they would continue attacking Jerusalem, continuing to damage the walls and the gates. And this was like an intimidation tactic from Satan 
The second attempt by Satan to derail their efforts was that their enemies requested to meet with Nehemiah and even send a false prophet to him with an untrue message in the middle of his rebuilding process. He knew it was a trap, so he relied on the wisdom and discernment and declined to meet with them. The third attempt was <clears throat> interest in being charged to the poor people on the money and the grain that they were borrowing, the people who still lived in Jerusalem. This had the chance to split the people right down the middle because of the charging of the interest. So Nehemiah corrected that practice saying that they were on the same team and to rebuild the wall and were not to profit from each other's misfortunes, but rather help each other. You know, at this stage with the COVID, there are many people who are very much in need. And, uh, you know, the Bible says that being kind to the poor equals lending to God. Proverbs 19, verse 17. <clears throat> I was leading a Bible study this week, and one of the men said, you know, I'm one of the few businesses, he said, that God has really prospered in this time. And he said, I made so much money in this time that I'm gonna give a bonus to all my employees. And he said, I'm gonna encourage my employees to use that bonus money to help people who are in need. <clears throat> but somebody tell me, if you would, what does that mean? And being kind to the poor, it equals lending to God. Say the question again, Jack. What does it mean when we say the Bible says being kind to the poor equals lending to God? <clears throat> does it mean God's always going to pay us back with money? <clears throat> Guys, are you there? I, I, I'll make a comment, Jack. So I think... Um, uh, no, it doesn't mean that God's always going to pay you back with money. I, I think that um, people who consistently go out there and give and serve realize that you get far more by doing that than you ever could imagine um, by doing something else. You know, giving is, uh, we, were, we were built as human beings to give. And uh, there's so many, so many things and I can probably, a lot of guys probably would agree with me that when you do give, you get way more out of it than the other people that, that, that you think that you're going to help. But really, it's helping you. It's helping you develop. It's helping you grow if you're giving your time and your talents, not just your money. Um, so those would be my comments, Jack. Matt, let me ask you a question. Sure. Do you feel you've gotten a lot more out of ministering to TJ than what you've given him? Oh, Yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent. That's easy. That's Amen. a layup, man. <laughs> not a, not a, not a, not a doubt in my mind on that for yeah. sure. Well, thank you for that response. Nehemiah went to Jerusalem and he inspected the walls by night so as not to alarm anyone by day. Now this was a, a miracle because the length of the walls was two and a half miles long. Their average height was about 40 feet high, and the average thickness to the walls was about eight feet thick. The walls contained 34 watchtowers and seven main gates open for traffic. Nehemiah would have looked at this and just felt totally overwhelmed, because as I mentioned to you, some of the walls were so short, were so knocked down that he could step over them. They weren't their typical 40 feet tall. So his strategy was to rebuild the areas first where they were most vulnerable. He was worried about their enemies attacking through the wall, its weaknesses. So he stationed families with weapons to guard them night and day and told them 
that the Lord would help them to defend the wall. Eventually, they worked with one hand on their weapon and one hand on their work. They even carried their weapon when they went for a drink of water. <clears throat> they finished the wall in 52 days, which was a miracle in itself. Should have taken over a year to do that. In Colossians, we read in chapter 3, verses 23, verse 23, Whatsoever you do, do so hardly as unto the Lord and not unto men. So they worked with all their hearts to accomplish this miracle. And I want to ask the question to the group here, and that is, you know, Nehemiah stayed motivated through this whole course of action. And how do we stay motivated and positive through the stress and the burnout and the disappointment of the COVID-19. <laughs> Somebody share your ideas with us on that. Well, Jack, if I may. Yes, Harry. Um, one of the things that we have done is turn the TV off. Uh, if you're looking for something positive and something wholesome, I doubt you're going to find much of it on TV um, as far as the news goes and the depressing stories that we hear. Uh, I think uh, Matt was right in how we serve our community, how we serve each other. Um, look to how what you have to give can mean to someone who has a little or nothing. And it doesn't always have to do with economics. There are children that are out there today struggling. Um, there are families that are struggling. And it's not just food they need. They need someone to show them what Christ meant for all of us to do, to be there for them and to serve. And there's so many ways, so many ways that we can do that. And it won't infringe upon our daily activities. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you, Harry. Hey, Jack. Um, this is Bill, not Chris Kafer. Uh, but uh, I do want to uh, say that as I sit here this morning, you know, you don't have to look too far to see the people that have been affected in a much greater way. And um, I mean, <laughs> Harry, for example, um, he's still upbeat and positive, uh, and he's been challenged with his health and, and his normal routine, and he just takes it in stride. And, um, you know, I think about uh, in my own life, sometimes I just let the little things, you know, get me down. When in fact, um, it, it takes, you take your eyes off, off the mission. And so, again, I'm encouraged by you men that are, that are speaking up and, and uh, talking about, you know, the positive things. Um, I know as a family, we pulled together kind of our quarantine group and uh, we've seen a lot of each other, but it's been great. I feel like we've become closer through all this. And so um, I'm encouraged. Does anybody have a, uh, almost like a phone call ministry where you're calling friends or associates just to encourage them? Hey, Jack, uh, let me, let me share with you. Uh, one of the things I've read your book and, uh, I admire my, I admire you, uh, beyond, uh, anybody's ever expectation. And, uh, you've seen uh, when I've sent you an email, uh, my signature in my email, I'll read it actually right now. It says, while on this ride call life, you have to take the good with the bad, smile when you are sad, love what you've got, and remember what you had. Always forgive, but never forget. Learn from your mistakes, but never regret. People change, things go wrong, just remember, <coughs> the ride goes on. Love it. 
Amen. Hey, did you, Jim, did you write that yourself? Uh, I, 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 I can't remember where I found it, but no, I did not write it. I am not that creative. It, but it, <laughs> when I saw it, I said, that's it. That's life. And, yeah, you know, that's, that, that's, that's, you know, that's my life. Uh, uh, I've been through my own toils, not, nothing like yours. I mean, I lived through a Marxist revolution and had to flee the country I was living in and all that kind of stuff. So the ride goes on. Remember that. Jim, yeah. this is Tim Gibbons. Will you send that to me, please? Sure will, Tim. I'll just send you an email and you'll have it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Me too, Jim. Yeah. And we'll get, well, uh, we'll get Chris or somebody maybe put that one in the notes. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll send it to you and Chris and Harry. Uh, <coughs> Harry, if you look at any past emails I've ever sent you, it's in there. No, thank you, Jim. That's very encouraging. Nehemiah, he finished the wall in 52 days. Should have taken a year, as I mentioned. As a result of the walls being rebuilt, thousands of people returned to Jerusalem and their enemies feared them because they knew that God had worked a miracle to rebuild the gates and the walls in 52 days, a record time. <clears throat> Nehemiah became Jerusalem's governor for over 12 years, and afterwards he returned to his king in Susa. <clears throat> he later returned to Jerusalem again to check their progress. And rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days was a miracle. Miracles can come in many different formats. And in Africa, the one that probably impacted me the most was a miracle that did not include a healing. But every time I'm in this area, I think about it in, in Zambia, Africa. And it had to do with our manager of African operations. And when he was a senior in college, his roommate said, Jake, and let's say his roommate's name was Bill. I don't know what his name was, but let's say his name was Bill. Jake, he said, what are you going to do when you graduate? And Jake said, I'm going to become a missionary to Africa. Well, Bill said, he said, Jake, when you become a missionary to Africa, he said, will you invite me to come over and visit you? He said, I've always wanted to go to Africa. He said, my only connection with Africa was, he said, my aunt went to Africa 20 years ago to be a missionary somewhere in Africa. We don't even know where she went. And he said, we never heard from her again. So we assume she got eaten by a lion, <laughs> which is what a lot of people assume over there. So let's say two years later, Jake ends up in Africa. In Africa, he's out and his roommate comes to visit him. He takes him out to a mission that my wife and I have gone to many times, deep in the bush. And as, he, as his roommate is visiting him, out of the corner of his eye on this mission, he notices there's a there's a gravesite there with flowers all around it. And Bill asks Jake, he says, you know, what is that? And Jake says, I don't know, some missionary lady, go, go check it out. Bill goes over and he says, Jake, you're not going to believe this. This is my aunt's grave. My aunt who came here 20 years ago, somewhere in Africa, she came right here. Now, Africa is bigger than the continent of North America. And here, God was able to lead him right to that one area where his aunt was buried. Well, Jake said, I had no idea that was your aunt. He said, this lady made more of an impact than maybe 10 missionaries put together. He said, you see the church over there? She built that church. He said, you see the school right next to the church? She built that school. You see the clinic right down the street? She built the clinic. And she also set up an orphanage and, you know, ministered to many, many orphans. He said she was so successful that the president of Zambia, 
he named one of the days after her and called it Gloria Payton Day because she made such an impact in that area. So anyway, about two years later, one of his or one of her remaining orphans, the only remaining orphan, he came to us and Jake was there also. And the orphan said, he said, I've got all the newspaper clippings of this lady. He said, I'm going to give it to you, Jake. Take it back to the United States and give to your family to let them know what happened with your aunt. You see her, his aunt left when she was 68 years old to minister in Zambia. She ministered for 20 years and she died when she was 88 years old. 88 years old, she was still making a huge impact. Now, a lot of us are up there in age. We feel like God has written us off because of age or maybe because of types of medical types of conditions that we have. And yet God is saying, hey, I'm going to use you like I've used Nehemiah. I'm going to use you to get in the midst of this COVID situation and to be an encouragement to the people around you. And I want to just say to you that regardless of medical condition, and Harry's a prime example of that, regardless of age, God is still there to use you and to make you have a tremendous impact. Very similar to Gloria Payton in Africa. And <laughs> don't worry, I don't think he's going to lead you to Africa. But uh, you have a ministry right here in the United States. God still works miracles. So uh, it's just an encouragement that every time I go past that grave, I realize that God is a miracle working God. He not only does miracles as far as health, he does miracles like the one that I just mentioned to you to be able to be a tremendous encouragement to the people that would hear this kind of story. <clears throat> We're getting close to winding up here. Anyone else have anything to share? Or any this, other is Wayne, this is Wayne Williams. I, uh, I believe in miracles and I believe that, that God will provide you a miracle if you ask him. And I think in many cases, we discount the fact that God will perform a miracle for us. And so we never ask. And so I believe that in my faith, I believe that, that if you are, if, uh, Nehemiah, for instance, God heard his prayer and effectively worked a miracle by, by rebuilding the wall. There were no caterpillars. There was no cranes. There was no, I mean, People did it by hand and they rebuilt the wall and it's a big wall for in 52 days. And so I think that we should take, our takeaway from this should be that no matter how much trouble you're in or no matter how hard you've got, if you just pray, the Lord can, can help you. He, he is not here to hurt you. And so therefore you can claim that prize that says, Lord, I need you. And I need you to help me. And I do believe that he will hear your prayers. Amen. Uh, hi, guys. This is Jimmy. Uh, I agree with you 100%. And what it reminds me of is the verse that says, according to your faith, let it be done unto you. Because the miracles happen when someone has <clears throat> faith to believe that a miracle can happen. That's what Jesus and the disciples always said according to your faith, what do you want me to do? So that's a good message. Yes. Jack, I'm all about the strength that you are oozing all over this feed this morning because like Bill said, man, it's got to be a challenge to just do anything at all and stay focused on the Lord. So thank you so much for that encouragement that I'm feeling that I'll walk in today and that I'll be reminded of any time that I try to fuss or complain. I wanted to just go ahead and say out loud what you put a little earlier because it touched me so much and I know it'll be a blessing to everybody. And it's basically the hook 
of the song, The Blessing, and it's basically in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and in your going and in your weeping and your rejoicing. And then I put, please remember, he is for you. He is for you. He is for you. And then I read the blessing from Moses because to me, in order to traverse this journey called life, oftentimes we have to look back and pick up something from the past or pick up something of good to take us along the way. So I'm reaching back to Moses and picking up no numbers 624 through 26. And it's a blessing for all of us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So basically, thank you so much, man, for whatever you're about to close on and whatever you're doing next, because I'm one that's touched on this group. And if this recording goes out or when this recording goes out, oh, somebody else is going to be blessed too. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this day. Amen. Well, thank you. Big V, I think all of us would agree. You talked about the countenance of God. We can see the countenance of God on your face the minute you walk in any of our Bible studies and that big smile. And uh, it's an encouragement just seeing your smile every time. I get it from Russell. We're in training together. Russell, Russell. Thank you, Russell. Amen. Well, Jack, um, you have certainly blessed us all this morning and encouraged us uh, with your strength that somehow you you reach down and grab your bootstraps and you keep going. And I think you are an excellent example to each one of us to just take a moment and pause and uh, just recognize how good we really have it. And I'm, I'm blessed the fact that you're still serving God this morning in light of the challenges that you have. And uh, we appreciate that and uh, want to encourage you uh, that if you need anything, uh, I know that we're going to, to pray in a moment. And uh, But other than that, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, and anything that we can do to help you because, uh, you know, I know that you would be in a high-risk category as far as being able to go out. If you need one of us to go by and pick up groceries for you or do something of that nature, please, Jack, do not hesitate. You know how much we love you and appreciate you, brother and want to encourage you and be available um, in any way that we possibly can. Uh, thanks, gentlemen, uh, for everyone that has joined us this morning uh, and uh, appreciate the continued support. Um, I would encourage you, I'm running about a week behind um, on posting on the videos on YouTube, but uh, I would encourage each of you to go check it out. Men's Bible Study of Tampa Bay, and also uh, follow. So when I do finally get it posted, which I'm trying to work in with my other, you know, commitments, uh, but uh, when I do post, it will notify you, and you can go back if you want to refresh or listen to a message again. Um, I've asked Dennis Noto uh, to please close us out in prayer today. Tim had a commitment uh, he had to, to be at by 8 o'clock, and so, uh, Dennis, if you could give us a closing prayer, I'd appreciate it. That. And uh, again, if you'd, in the process of that prayer, lift Jack and his, and his family up through all this, I'd really appreciate it. Again, thank you so much, Jack, for being with us this morning. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jack. Uh, dear Lord, we come before you as humble servants. Um, each of us has uh, a road to, uh, to go through, a, a path, and uh, each of us have... Uh, very trials, tribulations, issues, but um, we lay them at your feet because we have faith and we have hope. And our hope is based on you because you are the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all, including not just the universe, but each one of us physically. And we pray for a complete and total healing for our brother, Jack Fuller, that, uh, he can be a walking miracle, uh, free of cancer, uh, free of health issues, and that uh, you would bless him with many years uh, going forward to serve you, as that woman did till she was 88. 
We, uh, we pray for our nation, which is right now not only uh, dealing as well as the world with a uh, plague, a virus, we pray for a vaccine. May it come quickly that physically heals people and also physically prevents people from uh, uh, getting uh, this plague. Uh, we pray that there will not be another one or a mutation of it to follow. We pray, but more, more importantly, we pray for our nation's restoration to come to you, that churches will not be burned, that people will not be attacked due to their skin tone, nor their occupation, nor their looks, nor their name, nor where they live, nor their address, nor uh, uh, what they believe, that uh, we would find um, people to rise up in communities, including Tampa, Tampa Bay area, uh, to lead us uh, in your path, not a political path, but in God's path. We pray all of this uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, and we just thank you for this opportunity for all of us to be together. In uh, Jesus Christ's name, the Messiah, I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>